Listen now to the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd. For all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Huffington Post recently posted an article that carried this headline. So much for religious people being more righteous. So much for religious people being more righteous. A team of researchers recruited more than 1,200 men and women between the ages of 18 and 68, initially surveying them to indicate their level of religiosity, from not at all to very much, as well as where they fell on the political spectrum, from very liberal to very conservative. The participants were then given instructions to describe any moral or immoral acts they had committed, been the target of, or heard about within the prescribed time frame. And without going into detail about their methodology, which some describe as controversial, their finding was this. Religious and non-religious people alike reported experiencing around the same number of moral acts. Does that surprise you? No identifiable difference between religious and non-religious folk in terms of moral action or moral judgment. The study also indicated that no difference was found between liberals and conservatives. People reported committing good deeds more often than bad deeds and reported hearing about bad deeds more often than good ones. Isn't that interesting? Now, we could sit here all day and debate the merits or shortcomings of this research project, but I believe it does raise an important question for all of us to consider this morning. How does your faith impact the way you live? How does your faith, what you believe, reveal itself in your actions? Most simply, are you putting your faith into practice, or are you all talk? I love the story we've heard from Matthew's Gospel this morning, which begins with an encounter between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. As Matthew tells the story, Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry. He's just entered Jerusalem. You remember Palm Sunday, don't you? And the first thing he does when he gets there is he marches into the temple and throws out the money changers who were making a profit off the religious obligations of the people. And in doing so, Jesus in no way endears himself to the religious authorities. Well, Jesus returns again to the temple to teach, and he is confronted by the religious bigwigs, the chief priests and the elders. And they ask him a very pointed and direct question. 
By what authority are you doing these things? In so many words, who do you think you are? What right have you got, Jesus, to come into this holy place, cause such a ruckus, and then start teaching everyone? The people need to be listening to us, not you. Who gave you this authority, they ask. Well, Jesus is very clever, and I love his response. He says, I'll make a deal with you. I'll answer your question if you'll first answer a question from me. And Jesus puts it back on them. He says, where did John the Baptist get his authority? Was his authority from God, or was it only from the people? You see, Jesus has cleverly backed these religious leaders into a corner because no matter how they respond to his question, someone's going to be upset with their answer. If they say John's authority came from God, then Jesus will say, why didn't you listen to John? Why did you reject John and his message of repentance? On the other hand, if they say that John was just some popular preacher with no divine commission from God, the people will be furious because so many of the common folk flocked to John and believed he was a modern-day prophet. You see, it's a lose-lose proposition. And the religious leaders clearly understand this. So what is their reply to Jesus? I love this. They say, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Isn't that a great answer? We don't know where, God, where John got his authority. And Jesus says, okay, if you're not going to answer my question, I'm not going to answer yours. But then he goes on to tell a story, beginning with these words. What do you think? What do you think? Once upon a time, Jesus says, a man had two sons. The father went to the first son and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. The son is honest, if not obstinate, and says, no, I don't want to. Not going to do it. Does this sound familiar to any of you parents out there? The father approaches son number two and says, I want you to go out and work in the vineyard. Son number two says, yes, sir, I'm on my way. Now, you've got to understand that the first son has done a terrible thing in disrespecting his father by saying no. In the culture of Jesus' day, it was considered a very shameful offense against one's father to show this kind of contempt. And there's very little you could do to make amends for such bad behavior. This is a parable, though, a story through which Jesus is teaching a surprising lesson. Jesus says that in the end, the first son, the son who said no, the son who showed such great disrespect for his father, he changed his mind and he went out to work in his father's vineyard. The second son, the good and respectful son who said yes to his father's instructions, well, he ends up sitting on his lazy rear end all day and didn't do anything that his father asked of him. So Jesus asked the religious leaders another question. Which of these two sons did the will of his father? When it gets down to it, which of the two did the will of his father? Now in this instance, they can't plead ignorance because it's so obvious. The first son, they say. The first son who initially said no, but later changed his mind. The bad son who showed such disrespect. He went out to the vineyard. He did the work. He did the will of his father. Now Jesus minces no words and says to these religious leaders, I promise you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering God's kingdom ahead of you. A more contemporary paraphrase of the gospel puts Jesus' words in this way, crooks and whores are going to precede you into God's kingdom. Jesus minces no words at all. Will Willimon says, see, these are some of the most scathing words that Jesus speaks in the entire gospel. You see, Jesus reads in the riot act and he confronts these religious frauds with the truth of their own hypocrisy. Do you hear what he's saying? You religious leaders are just giving lip service to God. You're saying yes to God, but doing nothing about it. You're like that, that son who says the right thing and does nothing. You're big on talk and you're short on action. However, Jesus says, these sinners, these, these scumbags, if you will, tax collectors and prostitutes, they're going to get into God's kingdom ahead of you. Why? They might have said no at first, but in response to my message in John's, they've changed their minds, they've repented, they're going in a different direction. They're now doing what God has asked them to do. 
My brothers and sisters, it seems very plain to me that Jesus will not settle for lip service when it comes to being a disciple of His. Jesus isn't interested in you or me embracing a faith that is shallow or superficial. He wants you and me to put our faith into action. He prefers a faith that is seen and shown in the way we live our lives in response to God's goodness and God's grace. So let me ask you, is your discipleship just talk? Or are you putting your faith into action? As you live out your faith, are you only concerned with getting the words right? Or are you more concerned with getting your life right with God? Even though you may have said yes to God with your lips, are you saying no to God in the way you live your life? Someone has made this observation about Jesus. What was the main thrust of Christ's ministry? Did he just sit under a fig tree telling stories or or stand on a mountain explaining his theology? No, his ministry was tangible proof of his love for everyone, including the sick, the ostracized, and even those who were believed by their neighbors to be suffering the punishment of God for their sins. This was a powerful witness. Christ was a doer, one whose faith took the form of action, not merely words. The author of this is former President Jimmy Carter. And I can say that I agree with Jimmy Carter on at least one thing. Christ was a doer. One whose faith took the form of action and not merely words. Does your faith take the form of action or is it merely lip service to God? Some of you I know have read Kyle Eidelman's recent book, Not a Fan. His premise is simple. It is this. In the Gospels, Jesus never seemed too interested in fans. Is that how you define your relationship with him, an enthusiastic admirer, close enough to Jesus to get the benefits but not so close to require sacrifice? He was looking for followers, not just any follower, though, but a completely committed follower. Are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower? Does your faith have walking shoes? Reggie McNeil, in his book, Get Off Your Donkey, I preached a sermon on that book about a year or so ago. The title was worth the price of the book, let me tell you. He tells of a a conversation he shared with a young man who was tutoring school kids in the poorest and most crime-ridden part of his city, a place with unbelievable challenges. McNeil describes his friend's experience in this way. The apartment complex Harry works in has had multiple murders in the past 12 months alone. It took over a year of his being in that community for the parents of the kids to trust him. Harry spends at least 10 hours a week working with his own mentorees. In addition, he is raising money and recruiting volunteers for an after-school program he dreams of establishing that will change both the destination and the destiny for the kids in this area. This young professional does all this on top of his work and family responsibilities. As I listened to his story, I asked him, aren't you exhausted? He answered, there's a good tired and a bad tired. Then with a smile, he added, my work with the kids is a good tired. This is what I am meant to do. This is what I'm meant to do. My friends, what is your faith calling you to do? How is your faith expressing itself in and through your life? Are you just giving God lip service? Or does your faith lead you to action? Does your faith give you purpose and direction in your life? Reggie McNeil also makes this comment in his book. Just saying something is important to us doesn't make it so. What we do is what we believe. What we do is what we believe. I don't know if I've ever shared with you before uh, one of my favorite prayers. It's just one sentence long. It says this, God grant that the heat in my heart will melt the lead in my feet. (laughs) My brothers and sisters, as we begin this new week, let's give Jesus more than lip service. Let's be more than enthusiastic fans or ardent admirers of Jesus. Let's say yes to him 
with our whole selves, putting our faith into action, striving to be and to become fully committed followers. Let us pray. Save us, Lord, from a faith that is merely talk. And help us to respond to your call to discipleship fully and completely with our lives. Truly, may the heat in our hearts melt the lead in our feet as we get busy doing the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.